Well, I'm so grateful that you took the opportunity to join us for our Bible study today. Notice we're going on vacation here, a little bit to the beach, to Tahiti. For those who've been to the building, you would know, and to our worship space uh, in our fellowship hall, you will know this is actually the mural that's off to the right of the uh, worship space. It was painted by one of our teenagers a few years back. And so we're taking the opportunity of just taking your mind a little bit to a little different place. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the blessings of this day and for the opportunity to do Bible study. We pray that you would open up your word to us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, we are continuing our look at the book of 1 Corinthians. We don't have that much more time that we're going to be spending in the book of Corinthians. And so I hope that you've enjoyed this study. But I want to remind you again why this book was written. It was written to a church that was experiencing a tremendous amount of conflict. The rich versus the poor. The Greeks versus the Jews. And so it was a conflict within this church, not unlike the conflicts that we have in our own congregations. New members versus the old lifelong members. How oftentimes do lifelong members say, we'd love to have new people. New people come in and new people bring chaos. And it's like, well, we want new people, but we want them to contribute to the offering, but we want them to shut up and sit in the pew and do what we tell them to do. Well, they're going to go find another congregation, aren't they? This is the type of conflict that existed within the church back all the way in the day in Corinth. So... Our lesson for today isn't addressing so much the conflict, but if you remember where we left you off last week, Paul was kind of using his authority to say that I'm the one that brought you the good news, so pay attention to me. God spoke the good news, which again is the resurrection. That's the most important thing. The resurrection is the important thing of Christ. The death, the resurrection of Christ, that is what we proclaim. Everything else is unimportant. Why are you getting lost in all these other details? And he said, after all, I'm the one that brought that message to you, so I think I'm carrying a little bit of authority. But it's not my authority, by the way. It actually comes from God. So that was kind of last week's lesson. And today, right after that, we pick up with uh, a thing on resurrection. Now, a little bit of background about this. You might think that to believe in God means that you believe there's a life after. And that's not actually true. There are a lot of people who don't believe, or believe in God, but don't necessarily believe there's any type of resurrection or life after. Like, who am I talking about? Well, certain groups of Jews. For instance, you had, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees. They, by the way, believed that there was a resurrection. But then you also had this group called the scribes. The scribes believed in God. They didn't believe that there was a resurrection. They believed that when you died, you were dead, you were gone. The legacy that you left was your family. The same thing is actually true in the Old Testament. We see many Old Testament passages, in particular early on, where this was what the, the way of thinking was. There was not a, a thought process. There was some type of life after this one. You lived your life, you were a good Jew, you were faithful to God, God would prosper you, God would give you family, fill your quiver <laughs> your, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with arrows, so that basically your family, so that when you died there was that your family to carry on your legacy, and this was the belief of who God was and your relationship with God. There was no understanding of a resurrection. And what that was a much later development in the understanding of the Jewish relationship with God. Much later. I don't think Moses believed that there would have been a resurrection. Abraham would not have believed that there was a resurrection. Okay? There wasn't an understanding of a resurrection until much later. In fact, probably not until after the Babylonian captivity did this concept or this idea of resurrection start taking root within the Jewish nation. So... These folks were actually not all that unusual. However, this group was. They believed that there was something after life. The Pharisees. Now, we often see the, the Pharisees as the punching bag in our New Testament lessons in the Gospels. 
But I will tell you what, for the most part, the Pharisees were very respectable, uh, good people. Okay, now they may be uh, where a lot of the conflict comes in with Jesus. But uh, again, they were faithful, kindly, goodly, godly people throughout the nation of Israel, trying to guide them and direct them. And of course, they were the ones that taught about this concept of the resurrection, that there was something beyond this life. So again, uh, that was kind of the newer innovation. So it wouldn't be unusual that there were still some Jews who came, became Christian who didn't believe there was a resurrection. And Paul is like, how does this even make sense? For the whole point of Jesus was not just that he died, nice heroic thing, but also that he rose again. You know, let me tell you, oh, it's... It's Valentine's Day. It was Valentine's Day yesterday. And you want to talk about love. When people ask me about resurrection, I just tell a very simple thing. God loved us so much that he was willing to die for us. But God's love is so relentless that not even the grave can keep God's love from us. Hence the reason for the resurrection. That is how ferociously God pursues us. And so that's the content of our lesson for today. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. So remember, Paul has just finished this lesson reminding them of the important thing of the resurrection. Some people are saying, I'm not sure there is a resurrection. Paul says this, If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? In other words, how could you even call yourself a Christian? That is the whole point of what we've been proclaiming to you, that God's love is relentless. Death doesn't keep it down. It always comes back. <laughs> so if there is no resurrection of the dead, and Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then a proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. <laughs> so you may as well just go back and just beat each other up, right? What's the point of all this? Why are we attempting to even live as a church? if there is no resurrection. Now, in Jewish theology, there was room for the scribes and the Pharisees, those who believed in the resurrection and those who didn't. That's okay. But in Christian theology, there is no meaning to Jesus Christ without the resurrection. He wasn't just a nice man with a few nice things to say. And, oh, by the way, I think there were some nice things that we could learn from Jesus. But I certainly wouldn't be a pastor right now. I wouldn't be wasting my time. This is what Paul is trying to say. Now, I can tell you there are some ELCA pastors in our denomination who don't believe in this Jesus thing and don't believe there's a resurrection. It's just a fable and a fairy tale that we are meant to uh, gather some inspiration from this. Well, honestly, it's a waste of my time to be a Christian pastor if there is no resurrection. This is what Paul is trying to say. He goes on. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that he was raised from the dead. So, if there is no resurrection, and I'm sitting out here proclaiming a resurrection, I'm misrepresenting God? That's what Paul is saying. He goes on, For if the dead are not raised, and Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sin. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> death... <clears throat> is again related to sin, resurrection, to that relentless pursuit of God for you. But this is one unit. <clears throat> it's not just death. 
It's death and resurrection. The death, of course, is God doing something about our sin. Now, I, <clears throat> you know, there is oftentimes in the Bible this exchange language about sin. Well, instead of our death, it's Christ's death. I'm not sure that's exactly how it works, okay? But I think that's how it describes it sometimes because it's for our limited minds and our, our thinking. I would say it much more simply this way, that um, Christ came to announce God's love amongst us. We could think of nothing better to do with the love of God than to kill it because love is a threat to a selfish way of life. So we kill love. I don't know, Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, I don't know, Mahatma Gandhi. Anytime somebody represents God's love, we kill it. But the difference between Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Gandhi is they didn't, they stayed dead, okay? They stayed dead. They couldn't do anything except proclaim a message about God's love. But Jesus is God's love. So we kill it, and unlike other messengers of God's love, this is God's love, and so it comes back. It was raised for us. And uh, so death, resurrection, they're a tag team. They're a pair, okay? They go together. It's, uh, we talked a little bit about this heresy that there's something separate called the body and the spirit. There is no such distinction between us. Body and spirit, we talk about them like they're body and spirit, what's inside, what's outside, but they're really one unit. They go together, okay? And that's biblical theology. They go together, body and spirit. There is no whole, there's no life of a human being outside of them being connected with the, the body. When we're, we're resurrected, we're resurrected as physical beings, okay? as a, a body and a spirit. They go together. Death and resurrection are a team. They go together. All right? And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. Let's see. We go on. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile, he says. And then verse 18. Those who have died in Christ, they've perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all people most be pity. You know, all of us have lost loved ones. All of us have that day where we yearn to be reunited with those loved ones again. It is part of the hope that gets us through this life. In the, mean, in the meantime, we have this thing called memory. We remember them. We make their, their life powerful in our lives. And it helps us get through. But every single one of us, maybe we have a story. Oh, it's almost like I heard my father's voice. I saw my mother sitting at, on the foot of my bed. People will come and tell me this after they've lost their loved ones. I found things I was in a great pit of despair when all of a sudden I, I stumbled on a letter that my wife had written to me. Maybe they're trying to say something to me. And so people come and tell me this and they say, am I going crazy? And I'm like, I don't think so. See, because all of us want to know or at least believe that our loved ones are in God's care. And that, so, and that maybe somehow God is communicating to us a message from them. I don't know. There's nothing in the Bible that says one way or the other. Who cares? And if somebody believes that, and if, if they believe that, that they found comfort in a vision that they saw of their mother sitting on the foot of their bed, who am I to argue with that, right? Good for you. Hold on to these things. Because I have no reason to doubt that these are revelations that God has given you to help you through. We all yearn to be reconnected with those loved ones who've gone before. And we believe that that's part of this message, the death, the resurrection of what Christ came to be, to bring to us, to deliver us certainly from sin, our brokenness, 
but also give us that hope that we can live our lives with God, separated from sin one day, in a time where we are without that division that was dividing the Corinthian church that divides us here in this country and in our churches today. We'll be united, reunited. We will live a full life with those whom we love. Without this hope, if, if we've been living this Christian life and there is no resurrection, what does he say? We are most of all people to be pitied because we've wasted our time hoping for a pipe dream. Our last lesson, word for today is this, and oh, this is so powerful. Listen to this, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have died. Okay, I want you to hear that last part again. The first fruits of those who have died. See, before Christ, I, you know, the Jews, the scribes were correct. There was no resurrection. Not until Jesus. You died, you're dead, you're buried. And then comes Jesus, the relentless love of God, who is the first resurrection. The first fruits that opens up the door to all of us. How spectacular is that? And so we have the privilege, the opportunity to live with Christ because of what he has done. I'm going to leave you with that hope today. Those little mini visions that God has given you of your loved ones. I would doubt it. It's a reminder that God has them in his care, and they're in such a good place. To die is to be with God. Oh, I don't yearn to die. To live, we have opportunity and gain here as well too, Paul says. But we know that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for the hope of the resurrection. The reminder of the new life that we have in Christ. We ask that you once again bless us with your presence this day. Remind us that our loved ones whom we miss so dearly are in your care. There is no better place that they could be. We'd love to have them here. But we know because of what Christ has done, we have the privilege and the opportunity to once again be reunited with them. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.